Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast sponsored by Logos Bible Software, where we bridge the gap to reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. And today we're doing a book club episode. The book is called Neo-Calvinism, written by Gray Satanto and, and Corey Brock. And it is published by Lexham Academic. So we're going to jump into this episode here in a moment. And if you go to our show notes, there is a link to Lexham Academic. Hit that link, get this book for yourself. There's also some other resources as usual for you guys. You can find a local uh, confessional reformed church near your area to call home. Uh, click that link. You can also just find resources on how to communicate with Peter and myself. And um, so, yeah, uh, we'll jump into this episode. I'll let Peter further introduce Gray Satanto and Corey Brock today. Yeah, we have N. Gray Satanto, PhD, University of Edinburgh, is assistant professor of systematic theology at RTS, Reformed Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C., author of God and Knowledge, Herman Boving's Theological Epistemology of God. He is an associate fellow at the Neo-Calvinism Research Institute, which is helpful for this book. And Corey C. Brock, PhD from University of Edinburgh, the same place, is a minister at St. Columba's Free Church of Scotland in Edinburgh. So he stayed, actually, he went back to the States and went back to Edinburgh, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and an associate or an adjunct lecturer in theology at Edinburgh Theological Seminary. He's the author of Orthodox Yet Modern, Herman Boving's Use of Friedrich Schleiermacher, and co editor of the TNT Clark Handbook on neo-Calvinism, which is forthcoming. It's a pleasure having you both on the show. It's great to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Absolutely. And a, a fun little fact, those those who may not know, we're not terribly sure if we had a class together, but I know I saw him at the gym. But Grace Tonto and I went to Biola together. He was a grad of 2012, and I'm a grad of 2013. So we got two Biola grads on the same, on the same show. That's right. Biola churning out the quality stuff, I guess. That's right. Yeah, we have Dr. Horton. We have uh, Matthew Barrett. We we got a few other people who uh, you wouldn't expect come out of Biola, but but we do. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. So um, maybe let her. We'll start with uh, Dr. Brock, and then we'll go to Satanto after that. Let our listeners know a little bit about yourselves, your background, and your work. Yeah. Well, I'm from Mississippi originally. Grew up there and was raised there. A and... Mississippi boy in Edinburgh. That's right. That's right. Actually, there's a lot of Mississippi folks in Edinburgh. You'd be surprised at how many, huh. how many we've got. Uh, it's a steady stream. Um, yeah. So I went to Mississippi State University and RTS Jackson and huh. became a minister in the PCA and did a PhD with Gray at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and we we loved our time there together. Uh, we've continued to be close friends and work together on, on a lot of different projects. And so that's been a really sweet thing in God's providence. Uh, moved back to Jackson, pastored, taught um, a little bit of RTS as well. And then uh, in 2021, December, my family and I moved back to Edinburgh. I'm uh, ministering in the Free Church of Scotland there on the Royal Mile, right in the heart, right next to Edinburgh Castle. Hmm. And across, across the street, I teach at Edinburgh Theological Seminary. And uh, New College is uh, next door to Edinburgh hmm. Theological Seminary. So it's a really wonderful little trifecta of institutions that I'm able to be involved in there. And yeah, uh, we you love liked it, it but so right, much you literally stayed there. That's right. But uh, right now I'm in Knoxville, Tennessee at my um, in-laws for, for Christmas. So there you go. Nice. Cool. And then Dr. Satanto. Yeah. Um, well, I grew up in Jakarta, Indonesia, and Singapore um, before finishing up high school in Jakarta, Indonesia. I went to Biola for my undergraduate years, did a double major there in philosophy and biblical theological studies before going to Westminster, Philadelphia for my mm -hmm. MAR and then going to the University of Edinburgh with Corey. Uh, well, we met there. Um, I think he was a year ahead of me um, uh, for my PhD studies uh, on Herman Boving's theological epistemology, which that, that thesis became my first book in God and Knowledge and and focusing on just the questions of epistemology and how the doctrines of revelation doctrines of god uh, could impact the study the philosophical study of how we can know the world and how we can know um, ourselves and things like that so uh, we had a great time working on on bobbing there and finding out that there's just a lot of material from the neo-calvinism tradition that haven't been translated yet yeah haven't really been received properly and interpreted um 
carefully, perhaps in the Anglophone world, and seeing there's lots of different sides of this tradition. The Dutch receive the tradition a little bit differently than the Americans do. And um, we're also realizing that that Bavink is a primary source for these two receptions, both the Dutch European side and American side. And um, again, because Bavink was just recently translated, mm. people have received parts of the tradition, but not necessarily mm. one of the main streams under that tradition. And that prompted the writing of a book like this. Mm. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. And I actually... Um, kind of goes into this this question well. So maybe I'll talk to Dr. Satanto and if, if Dr. Brock, if you wanna if you wanna add into the, some of this stuff too. Um, what's what is some of the background behind this book? Because I know you guys have worked on Bob Inc. or, or and and somewhat on, on Kuiper too, I guess in the background. Uh, and this comes, like I said, both you've written on um, them in an academic setting. And so why an introduction after writing on them in an academic setting? Uh, did you see it necessary? Like, yeah, let's let's uh let's now, I guess, quote unquote, introduce them after we've already written on them. Yeah, um, well, the neo-Calvinist tradition is like a river that has an immense amount of tributaries flowing off from it. And mm. uh, some of these are uh, helpful and some of these have, have broken off so far away from the central river that they're mm. largely unrecognizable with respect to the tradition, the original tradition. Um, so a lot of North American um, folks uh, will know of, you know, reformed epistemology with planting on Walter Storff. We'll know of Gerhardus Voss, Cornelius Van Til, um, and maybe even reformational philosophy movements, Herman Doyeverd. And um, in the Netherlands and other places, they'll know more of J.H. Bavink and all sorts of people that flow from the neo-Calvinist tradition and are part of it. And streams come off of those guys and go on and on and on in all sorts of directions. One of the reasons we wrote this book was because we realized there was a real need to make clear mm -hmm. the original source from which everything else has flowed and to show both how many have diverted from the original uh, or upheld it and, and tried to walk in a manner consistent with the his, what we've called historic neo-Calvinism. And so, you know, as you guys know, academic work, PhDs, these things, they're very specific. Mm -hmm. You write on something extremely niche and, and tight. Yeah, you don't just write on neo-Calvinism, an introduction. Right. You don't do that. They, they won't let you do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's too and much. And so um, we're trying to take a step back here and uh, really help people to see what we begin to see as we went back to the primary sources, which is that the original uh, sources, Kuiper and Bavink in particular, for this tradition are rich, they're dogmatics first, they're theologically oriented, they're ecclesial, all the things that we had sort of been taught by way of um, general introductions in the past had, had largely not, uh, it had, hadn't accurate, accurately represented exactly the original tradition. Hmm. Uh, so, so we're trying to um, recover that. Uh, it's not a this book is not a popular level work necessarily. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's, uh, it's a hard read. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not um, an introduction at a popular level. It, it tries to kind of work at the same level that Bobby and Kuiper wrote at. Okay. So uh, probably tries to strike that sort of level. Um, and we're not trying to cover the entire corpus uh, or their theology in, in total, but actually unveil where they are both reformed protestant in expected ways and at the same time what's unique about the movement what uh mm. what they're doing that's slightly different than uh their uh their own tradition so th that's tried where we tried to emphasize um mm. um yeah so awesome yeah great if there's anything you want to add to that no that's a, that's a wonderful overview of what we're trying to do um and, and i think you know we'll get into this when we discuss the book further but but the neo and the neo calvinism stuff it's it's dependent on this this reception of reformed orthodoxy while mm -hmm. at the same time tweaking and updating the philosophical expositions to particular doctrines the way we use particular doctrines and so you're going to get all the sorts of doctrines that francis Tiritin or calvin or van maastricht dealt with yeah. but they're going to put their own spin on it and mm -hmm. and so one, some of those cultural engagements, material or church and world sort of distinctives that people have associated neo-Calvinism with are actually not just motivated by kind of like 
pragmatism or transformationalism, but it's actually motivated by theological convictions that they mm. think they need to to make um, mm. these sorts of cultural implications from. Mm. Awesome. Speaking of Bob Inc., I'm actually in the middle mm. of reading the wonderful works of God right here. Great Bob Inc. work. And then I, uh, right before that book, I read what is Christianity by Bob Inc. Yeah, so the I new got translation, yeah. Yeah, I got Bob Inc. in my mind too. So um, we really like to define terms on our show. And even though this is a little bit more of an academic book, I guess this is even more of a reason to kind of like define terms because we have some lay level audience people listening. So to kind of lay some fr- uh, groundwork, you, do you, you do provide a definition to neo-Calvinism in your book, so maybe you can kind of reiterate that. Is it simply Calvinism that is kind of repackaged and new, which is what I guess neo would probably indicate? Um, or is there another reason why neo is kind of affixed in front of the word Cal- Calvinism? Could you guys kind of help answer that for us? Yeah, I, I could try to give a first um, attempt at this question. So I think Part of an orientation sort of comment that we need to make, especially in the North American context, is to say that Calvinism in Kuiper and Bobbing's mind do not refer to the five points of Calvinism, mm-hmm. in the, which is what Americans think about when they think about mm. Calvinism. Yeah, you think and of so, Tulip, first and foremost. At least most people do, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Tulip, you know, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, yada, yada, yada. And it's we, we have to say this in every podcast. Um, <laughs> Neo-Calvinism is not new Calvinism. Okay. New Calvinism is the 21st century right yeah 2008 2009 kind of movement young restless reformed yep exactly associated with that sort of retrieval of just tulip among non-denominational baptist reformed yeah. groups just emphasizing this sort of soteriology doctrine of salvation yeah for mm. a new age this is not that at all so when you actually take a look at kuiper and Boving's writings on the term calvinism they actually argued that the term Calvinism is broader than the term Reformed. So Reform mm-hmm. for them referred to the confessional doctrine, which they want to uphold. So three forms of unity. Mm-hmm. In the OPC context, we would think of the Westminster Standards. Mm-hmm. And they would argue that Calvinism is broader. It's not just theology, but it's theology applied to every area of life. So mm-hmm. Kyber talks about Calvinism as a life system, world and life system. Uh, that's the lectures on Calvinism. That's where the, the term is being used there explicitly by Kuiper. And then Boving talks about Calvinism, especially in his text, Future of Calvinism, as not just, again, doctrine, but rather a whole cosmology, a whole physiognomy. That's his unique word. Um, uh, kind of the origins of the universe, er- everything, a particular Calvinistic take on every discipline, if that makes mm. sense. Mm. So they take that. Why do they call it that? It's because they they were inspired by Calvin's work and efforts in Geneva Mm. of seeing every area there as having sort of a leavening, a sort of effect from the Christian faith in some way. Now, so that's the Calvinism part. The neo part, uh, there's now that I'm reflecting this a bit more, the neo part refers to kind of... um, uh, in a specific way and then in a broad way. In the specific sense, the neo part refers to the fact that they think that Calvinism should have a public impact, mm. the theology should have a public impact, but they disagree that it should mean a unification of church and state. They disagree mm. that it should mean an established church or a national church, like what Calvin had done um, in, in Geneva and certain That's what nation... Kuiper broke off from. Exactly. The nation state model, which was very common among 17th century Protestant orthodoxy, there's there's Catholic countries, Protestant countries side by side, things like that. So they agree that it should have a leavening impact. Theology should have that, but they disagree that it should be an institutionalized, established sort of impact. Mm. Um, so that's a specific sense. So you read Kuiper on this. He's very explicit. This is where we broke off from Calvin. Yep. We see the mistake of Calvin in what he calls, in quotes, the fire of Servetus. <laughs> we should never do yeah. that. Yeah, um, yeah. And I think, you know, Protestants now would agree that that's a bad move. In the in the broader sense, the neo refers to that particular and critical reception of reform orthodoxy. So you, if you go through the, the different loci or different topics of, of, of doctrine that we covered in the book, we pick the doctrines where they actually said something specific about that. that they said something like, we like this doctrine, whether it's creation um, natural revelation, um, Catholicity, but we want to modify, tweak, update, 
criticize tr the tradition in some way on this particular doctrine. So that's why we didn't have a chapter on, let's say, um, doctrine of divine simplicity, because they explicitly, at least self they did do some creative things, maybe, but they self-consciously said, we don't want to tweak this doctrine mm, as much. Okay. Does that make sense? Corey? Yeah, totally. Very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Um, I mean, we've tried to capture this entire, everything Gray just said there uh, as the orthodox yet modern tendency. Um, yeah. But maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just add uh, just some of the the basics that, um, that Gray's, Gray's assuming as well, which is just simply to say that ne the neo-Calvinist movement was a theological ecclesial movement from really about 1880. Mm -hmm. And mm. Uh, the original first generation ends in, in 1920, 1921 with the death of, of Kuiper and Bob Inc., but then, of course, carries on from there after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there, there was not only the uh, theological ideas that Grace just uh, explained, uh, but, but also a, a number of historical factors that, that came into the development of the tradition. Uh, Kuiper and Bobby both saw themselves as part of a, a broader tradition that were reacting to the Enlightenment and mm. um, to mm. the spirit of revolution, as they put it, mm -hmm. in uh, especially epitomized in uh, the French Revolution in, mm -hmm. in 1789, the fall of the Bastille, especially. They saw that as the symbol um, of, of modernity. And so... Uh, they they sought not revolution but reformation and became part of a tradition in the Netherlands that uh, had been fighting against the Enlightenment and its ideas for for about a century. Um, but you had all sorts of other factors arise. One, uh, Gray talked about disestablishment. <clears throat> um, so one thing that had happened in 1848, you you had uh, an immense uh, movement across all of Europe where uh, monarchies were being. Um, made unimportant unimportant if not completely um discontinued and democracy really arising we call it the spring of nations uh and so you had all these historical factors and then also the the rise of the modern university was a big one and, and so in 1880 uh kuiper founds the free university of amsterdam mm -hmm. and you, you've got basically what's happening is for kuiper for bobbing uh for kuiper especially you had you know a new university in a new age uh for um, a, a new generation, and and he wanted that to be uh, thoroughly Christian, hmm. but not Christian from the top down, from the imposition of the state, hmm. wedding the state to the church, but from the bottom up. From uh, he he wanted, if you will, a Christian commonwealth, but uh, <laughs> by way but by way of the movement of the gospel hmm. uh, through the organic church, through education in the life of the university, through showing how Christianity matters for every science. Um, and so Bavink's dogmatics became the, the new theology, if you will, uh, yeah. of, of that define, of that define the tradition. Hmm. Yeah. That's good. So that, that actually what you last said kind of brings me to my, my next question was, I think when people are reading this, they're kind of expecting uh, my guess is it, like interaction with kind of the, the quote unquote famous works of both Kuiper and Bavink, at least the ones people know of the most, which is reformed dogmatics or, a lot of common grace, and you guys talk about stone lectures and common grace and whatnot. Um, but you you focus on a few works more specifically than than um, kind of the the broader, I guess, quote unquote, more popular stuff. Although you do focus on somewhat on that stuff. Um, and so I looked at some of your footnotes throughout throughout the book because I'm I'm weird and I do that. <laughs> but so when you when you're quoting some of these and you're using some of these, why why you focus on the works that you did? Because you talk about Bobbing's work on psychology and science and worldview and then Kuiper stone lectures um, and a few other works from his too. So what's, what's it, what's significant about these works specifically as it relates to the new Calvinism project? Well, I mean, we're, we're trying to um, do something uh, for the reader that that's uh, difficult if you don't have, um, you know, a full-time job dedicated to doing these sorts of things. Yeah, right. Yeah. And that's to, read the corpus pretty broadly and to draw together uh, the distinctives that probably uh, would be much diff more difficult to see if you were only reading one or two of the most popular works. Uh, I mean, almost everything that we we're doing in the book is contained in the most popular works, however, yeah. in, in the Bob and Kuiper corpus. 
so, you know, we, we were trying to pull together sources that uh, it's unlikely that most readers will ever get the opportunity to dive into. Um, that would be one reason. An another thing would be that um, th these are actually some of the most important works by these authors. Hmm. And we, we don't uh, in the book rely exclusively on English translations. Yeah. Um, but we did, I think, want to use more works that are translated to English um, than, than Dutch works that aren't. Um, and that is because it's a book written to an English speaking audience. And uh, we wanted to hopefully get people to go to the text. Um, and so there are uh, a, a lot of maybe more obscure works um, mm -hmm. that we reference in the book, but but many of them are translated. Mm -hmm. And we're we're doing that, uh, Gray and I and, and James Eglinton and others, we're, we're trying to add to that. So, yeah, I mean, a, a number of reasons contributed mm -hmm. to that. Yeah, and it's not what I'd like to before, Gray, if you want to add on to it. What's, and you you uh, signal this in your intro where you rely almost exclusively on the primary source. for So what Kuiper and Bovink actually said versus kind of secondary sources, what's been said about them. Um, although you do have some stuff on secondary sources, like you said, when it's helpful. Um, but it's 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 come from, it comes from the words themselves from the people who I guess founded this movement, and I also like too. It's it's not the stuff that you like. You'll say like, "Hey, this is something that we can either uh, like." I, I may agree or disagree, but it's, this is what they said. Yeah, exactly. So you know, it, it is the problem of translation and, and just the historical contingency of the reception of neo Calvinism. So, I mean, for instance, Kuiper. So even someone as famous as Kuiper and everybody quotes his you know every square inch under the lordship <laughs> yeah. of christ quote. if there's anything anybody knows from him it's that yeah exactly and i keep saying that if anybody just quotes that particular quote they've never read kuiper um <laughs> but but you know it's it's because they they if they have the lectures on calvinism for a long time yeah and they have basically just a second volume of the encyclopedia of of um uh sacred doctrine um for the for the most part but then really the, even the kuiper stuff is just recently translated the common grace material that you have uh pro reggae on education all these sorts of texts are, are very recent translations and so people have gone only a little slice of neo-calvinism mm. so they have kuiper in the stone lectures but they don't have kuiper in pro reggae when he's reflecting on his career they don't have kuiper on on common grace and what it means for all these different disciplines they don't have all of um and also even the historical analyses of, of, of common grace that Kuiper provided in the newer texts and then of course the bobbing thing i think i think we can't overestimate how much um the recent work and translations of bobbing will contribute to a rehabilitation and a redefinition of what neo-calvinism refers to hmm. um because i think what happened in the in the reception of it is that they take little quotes from lectures on Calvinism and maybe yep. a little bit of other works on Kuiper, never really read Bobbing. They never form a new Calvinism anything. in their own image. Exactly. And so the, the kind of American conversation of neo-Calvinism is just, let's engage culture. Let's just do this, you know, and let's be kind of almost triumphalistic about it because um, they just read lectures on Calvinism. But then with all this new works on, on Kuiper and Bavink, they're not recognizing, wait a minute, they're very nuanced about this. And they were very doctrinally focused about this. And an engagement of culture never meant the deterioration of theological orthodoxy mm. for them. And I think people have associated neo-Calvinism with theological thinness and like just empowering the lay people to get out there, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, just and, a triumphalistic or just a transform. It's become co-terminus with transformationalism. Exactly. And so little slices of, of Kuiper are also being used by figures like, let's say, Rush Dooney, yeah. the Reconstruction mm -hmm. Movement, Theonomy, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's very different than what the original sources are. Yeah, it's easy to form and shape if you have a sliver and not the whole corpus. Right, yeah. And there's an analogy here to what Richard Muller is doing with Calvin's influence, yeah. right? So and there's an, it's an accident of history that we have most of Calvin translated, or more of Calvin translated, than, say, Bullinger or Beza. And so even though Calvin is just one among many, he, his influence is seen disproportionately compared to the actual historical mm -hmm. context, if that makes sense. Gotcha. That's helpful. Yeah, this next question you guys have hinted at with the answers. So I apologize if there's a little bit of a repeat of what you guys were saying, but I think it's it's very important because there there is a confusion out there in the wider Reformed world that neo-Calvinism 
is kind of unhitched from the reformed confessions uh, or perhaps not as confessional as many would like. Um, when I, when I first created this question for you guys, my original part of the question was more of, I think what a lot of people wonder is, do you have to be um, a neo-Calvinist to go to a reformed church? But I think it's prefaced better in the way that, um, you know, connecting it to the confessions. So if you guys can kind of clarify that for me and, you know, describe um, the beginning of this movement and how the fathers of neo-Calvinism, Kuiper and Bavink, um, envisioned it when it comes to neo-Calvinism connected to the confessions. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the irony, the irony of that is that, um, the original neo-Calvinist movement is a movement that was trying to recover confessionalism mm -hmm. in its own context. And, um, Kuiper and Bob Inc. are, are, they confess the three forms of unity mm -hmm. in their tradition. And, um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the simple answer is that it was thoroughly confessional. That was in some ways the entire point. And uh, and at the same, I won't say however, but and um, <laughs> they, they understood that uh, confessions are boundaries um, mm -hmm. with with a lot of freedom within um, to think and to uh, speak in, in unique grammars and to uh, talk about secondary issues. Um, and so one of the distinctives I would say in the midst of their confessionalism was to not be um, uh, what we might call confessionalists or, or something like that, where um, the confession became uh, became the, the, the authority in a way that uh, didn't recognize that it was a human document. And, um, and instead what, what they did was they respected their confessions and confessed their confessions, but understood that, within the midst of those boundaries, Christianity can subvert and borrow and use uh, the grammar and the ideas of any philosophical system uh, that it deems true. Right. And so, um, you know, a few, a few examples of that uh, would be that, well, well, one of the most common examples that we use in the book and you'll see throughout the corpus is their adoption of the concept of the organism mm -hmm. or the, the organic. And so uh, they use the organic to describe the unending number of unity uh, of unities and diversities that exist in the creaturely world. So one of those would be uh, what a human being is in itself. We we're a unity and diversity. We're one thing, one consciousness, one identity composed of an immense amount of parts. Mm. Right. Um, and Kuiper and Bobbing tried to recast uh well, a number of doctrines, but let's say theological anthropology in the light of the organic motif, which was a motif that they had uh, they had ingested from, from their own modern modern context in the philosophical academy. Uh, and they, they described the organism as um, the unity and the diversity that uh, analog uh, analogously reflects God's absolute three in oneness, um, for example. And so within that, they were trying to say, uh, we believe in, in the classic, they're, they're classical theists. I mean, they, they mm -hmm. confess uh, the doctrines of God and, and of anthropology that, that of course we all know from the reformation and before, mm -hmm. and they want to talk about it in new ways in fresh mm -hmm. ways. So they want to talk about it in the light of the organic because the organic yeah. was uh, the, the grammar of the 19th century that they were swimming in. And so they're trying to do that. And, um, and, and be relevant and be helpful to, to people in the way that they talk about these doctrines. Yeah. I think that's, if there's anything, that's what throws people off is they're a confessional, but they speak about it in new ways that don't quote unquote sound confessionally grounded though. They are because they come from the confessions, but they're speaking into a modern context. Right. Yeah. And even the, the organic stuff, especially with regard to theological anthropology, I mean, they use that motif to, ground and also to defend very traditional doctrines like the fall yep. of man and adam yep like why can we be held accountable for adam's sin when i didn't sin yep. adam did i wasn't there well it's because we're an organic unity and adam is our federal representative he's the mm -hmm. unity in the organic center of the, of of humanity yeah. so or like um, in reform quote unquote speak would be like covenantal head which is like modern people are like what on earth does covenantal head mean exactly and why is, maybe it's closer 
why is that not just a legal fiction, right? We exactly. got we got to gift that sort of account. And you know, another example of of this is the doctrine of natural revelation, right? Mm -hmm. So in the Westminster Confession language, it's you know we know God by the way of the light of nature, mm -hmm. and um to take Romans one language, right? We all know God because we've perceived him through the things that have been made because God has shown it to us. And, you know, they were swimming in a romantic context. So if you want to read more about this as well, Corey's Orthodox and Modern book and mm -hmm. Bob and of is really important here. Well, how do we know God from nature in a way that says that, sure, there are atheists out there, but, you know, scripture says that everybody knows God. So they don't, mm -hmm. they don't say that they know God. But somehow they do know God. So how do we account for that? Well, with romantic um, language, suddenly we can say things like, "Well, God has created affects, um, affections in mm -hmm. in the even the non-believing heart." Mm -hmm. um, so now we can talk about natural revelation not just in terms of common notions or propositions or reason, but there's something underneath that if that makes mm -hmm. sense, um, uh, an implant in the heart. And so what we say could oftentimes not reflect what we feel in our hearts so that makes sense in self-deception so hmm. that's the kind of work that they're doing so they're they're in romanticism and they're they're seeing all this language of feeling and absolute dependence and things like that how do i still use that category and defend the very old and um frankly very conservative doctrine that everybody knows god even though they <laughs> yeah. claim that they know god yeah 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 suppression of knowledge and truth yeah yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. So with this, and this is, this is a slightly larger question, so it may be harder to answer in a more concise way, but attack this um, how you will, but both Kuiper and Bovink, like you said, they want to preserve and you, you've used the, the kind of the, the phrase, the system of Calvinism or kind of the, the life system of Calvinism while engaging. It's not just, and I think people think of Calvinism as kind of ju just siphoned off into soteriology or the, the tulip or, doctrines of grace which is which is what it is but they they use it in a much 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 broader way um the thought and life of calvin and, and, and how he engaged obviously in geneva and stuff but um and he's and they're engaging both Bavink and kyber with modern uh approaches to science and religion and psychology which uh, i think today like theologians don't don't tend to do and i think mostly rightly so because they're not they're not equipped to engage in some of these things but but they are they're they're engaged to equip in some of these things so how how does this shape their their thought and work? So they're preserving, like we just talked about, theological orthodoxy, confessionalism, or the confessional documents, and but they're also approaching modern presuppositions um, and insights. So they're they're uh, they're approaching modern thought, ideas, philosophy, science, uh, while preserving their kind of confessional heritage. So maybe maybe in a in a broad way, how how are they engaging in this project? Well, that's a very broad question. Yeah, um, I know, yeah, uh, it's, I know that's going to be hard to answer. Yeah, different different ways we can talk about it. Maybe I mean, um, since it's fresher in my mind uh, because we just translated it, but yeah. Christianity and science, which is yeah. coming out with Crossway. Go for it. Yeah. Um, you know, so so one of the reasons, well, Boving lists four reasons why he wrote that book. Um, one is he argues the rise or the um the competition of Roman Catholic higher learning. So if you take a look at the Roman Catholic uh, church and the institutional education um, and the system that they have, they provide there, it's very robust. Uh, they have a, a Roman Catholic say, so to speak, on every locus. And, and Bovink would argue that Protestant higher learning has not matched um, equally to the Roman, mm -hmm. their Roman Catholic counterpart. So we need an equally robust educational system that actually matches that Roman Catholic um, energy. And then secondly, it's the demise of materialism, that despite all the overreaching claims of the positivists, mm. the empiricists, the naturalists, we don't see religion going away at all, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, what we see actually, um, thirdly, is the rise of religiosity still, and yep. the rise of Islam, Buddhism, and even in that context, a kind of... Um, theistic idealism that was mm -hmm. coming out again um that's still very strong and then fourthly it's the emergence of the free university of amsterdam itself right mm -hmm. so i think i think one of the ways in which their convictions led them to the formation of the free university of amsterdam is that idea of christian worldview christian principles and and if the unbelief that they were facing in the enlightenment and the french revolution and the rise of nietzsche is um totalizing they're trying to say okay 
unlike the older framework, which said, we don't want Christianity anymore, but we like Christian ethics. This sort of framework says, we don't want Christianity in any area of life. Mm. So if there's a totalizing opposition, we need a totalizing response mm. that is different from the Roman Catholic totalizing response, if that makes sense. Yeah. We don't want to just be co-opted, if that makes sense. So, uh, so the formation of the university, the sort of activistic work that Kyber and Bavink did in um, journalism and parliaments and in politics, those sorts of things. But it's always for the sake of the ground up sort of movement. It's 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 a it's worldview, but it's not institutionalized worldview thinking. Yeah. It's not just an imposition, and it's it's a it's worldview thinking that is inductive. Um, there's so much we can say about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. in other words, it's not just an a priori system that we're going to use as a weapon to say I have a Christian worldview, so I can understand this, and you can't. Um, yeah. But it, it's basically saying if we are Christians, we come at the world with different principles and we should therefore expect a different way and a different result from mm -hmm. our research um, and we need one another to produce that worldview it's a holistic endeavor and it's an objective endeavor that requires the cooperation of many christians working together in the context of something like the university mm. um, so maybe i could say that as a start yeah no that's perfect well, yeah. I'll just add that um, dogmatics, systematic theology, is uh, is the search and, and attempt to know God by way of God's revelation and then to know all things in the light of God. Mm -hmm. So there's that secondary movement in dogmatics to know mm -hmm. everything else that God's made in the mm -hmm. light of God's reality. And, uh, you know, so from there we can say psychology exists because God created the mind. And that's why we have this psychological science. Uh, art exists because God created beauty and he created the possibility of human subcreation. Um, and, and so in some sense, there's no getting out from underneath this task. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just what we have to do. And it's, it's especially the Christian calling. And so because of common grace, Christians don't, because of common grace, which is a neo-Calvinist theological distinctive, but because yep. of mm -hmm. common grace, which I think is biblical, uh, Christians don't have the stronghold on the best of psychology and the best yeah. of art and the best yep. of the sciences, not at all. And so we've got a ministerial task, which is to know all things in the light of God. And that means necessarily engaging with the best of psychology, science, art, whatever it, it may be. Um, so every Christian ha has to do this. Um, this is just the task of wisdom in some ways and building the Christian worldview and then acting into it. And uh, I mean, talk about the, the ministerial task that that exists for every single age of the church. Um, uh, it, it, well, it's the work of contextualization and it's the work uh, that a Christian minister has to do constantly. You know, when, mm -hmm. when we are engaged in uh, chatting with our, our congregants about the decision between biblical counseling and, and, and the therapist, the therapist that, that they're seeing that they've been prescribed by a doctor. And they say, well, how should I receive the advice from the therapist? And mm -hmm. should I take the medicinal prescriptions that I've been and all these sorts of things? Well, that, that's a individual example of uh, the necessity of Christian Christianity's critical approach to modern science, art, psychology, philosophy, whatever it may be, adopting and adapting, appropriating, looking for truth wherever it can be found. Um, and so what I would say is that neo-Calvinist, Kuiper and Bob Inc. were just some of the first in the modern age to be incredibly self-conscious about this and uh, to be really awake to um, to critical engagement and the fact that we must do it. We must, we must do it. How can we do it hmm. best and how can we appropriate the truth of God wherever it can be found? Because wherever truth is found, it's because of God's gifts. And uh, so they were, they were, they were very self-conscious about that. Hmm. Mm, I like that. I'm on board with that and the idea of Christian ethics and integrity and helping the world out. Um, I have a question here and because we're doing pretty good on time, I actually have a question after this question. I'll let you guys answer this one first, but um, I'll, I have a perfect question after this one to kind of quote to end my part of the episode. Um, but I want to ask about um, the chapter you guys have in the book called the church in the world. Because you guys do uh, talk about a term uh, called 
transformationalist. And if you could help uh, describe what that is in relation to uh, neo-Calvinism. And then can you help explain both Kuiper and Bobby and how they understand the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of man, how they relate? Corey. Uh, yeah, <laughs> sure. We were just talking yeah, about I mean, this before the episode started. Yeah. 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 So th this is a big discussion, so we can yeah. um, put out a few ideas and uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's transformationalist transformationalism is uh, mm -hmm. can be defined in lots of different ways. I mean, it, it it's the idea within Christianity that the gospel um, is as has at least uh, as much social implication as it does uh, salvific implication, mm -hmm. and that the church is call uh, within that the mission of the church is to. Um, be an agent of transformation in the midst of the different arenas of society to the point that there's at least a, a visible, tangible, achieved difference in the social structures and uh, people's economic well-being, for, for example. Um, so that, that would be uh, a transformationalist idea in the most general way, and then that can be applied very specifically. I mean, what we're trying to do is disassociate transformationalism yeah. from neo-Calvinism. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we don't think that Kuiper or Bobby had had that idea in mind at all. Hence um, our provocative question. Yeah, right. Exactly. And I mean, what they did want to say was faith matters for all of life. And, yeah. and that's very different than being transformationalist. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, they very explicitly understood the mission of the church to be uh, proclamation, to be heralding the gospel, to be um, preaching and, and that that preaching need to be witnessed to indeed uh, as well but that that the only thing that was going to save sinners is uh, the good news that Jesus Christ died and rose again um, for us and so uh, they very much had the if you want to say evangelistic mission of the church at the center of what they understood the church to exist for but they wanted to also emphasize that uh, faith matters for all of life mm -hmm. and that um and they said this in some rather provocative ways, I guess, um, <laughs> yeah. which is at times, which is why I think there's a lot of confusion and, and differences in the in the tributaries that I mentioned at the beginning and, and the way this has been received. Mm -hmm. uh, so Bob Inc. has the uh, rather cheeky uh, way of saying it where he says that um, the gospel can ev evangelize state, society, family, culture, et cetera, that there's an, an evangelism that happens within these spheres of existence and um yeah i mean you have to you have to be really careful and, and read that in, in the context and understand what he means by that he doesn't mean by that that uh that um any sphere of existence in the current cultural order can be quote unquote saved uh redeemed from yeah. sin and enter uh into the new creation so um he he, he doesn't think that uh, not at all um, what he's saying there instead is that um, when the organic church Christians enter into all the spheres of society, that uh, that should really make a difference. And that should make a difference by being salt and light, by um, the work of word and deed ministry, mm -hmm. by way of um, understanding that uh, we've got a calling un unto the fact that godliness matters for everything. So Paul tells us that very clearly. Uh, so being being godly um, and acting into the world in a way that is attuned to the purpose of original creation, exactly what a creation exists for, mm -hmm. is going to matter in the sphere of art. It's going to matter in the sphere of biology. Of course, it's going to matter in the sphere of um, the judicial system, right? So a, a judge can operate uh, motivated by Christian principles to be dedicated to the moral law. Mm -hmm. in ways that judges that don't believe in that are going to function very differently. And, uh, yeah. and if I, you know, I, it, it's really an unquestionable, undeniable, uh, claim there, I think. And, um, so that, that's what they meant by, by while at the same time you know, upholding a big vision for the mission of the church as evangelistic. Um, I, I guess uh, another thing to say would be to, uh, put this in the broader theology of, uh, the kingdom of God, uh, kind mm -hmm. of a theology. And, and that's to say that they upheld with Augustine that the kingdom of God exists in antithesis to the kingdom of this world. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the distinction between the city of man and the city of God and the problem, the antithesis, uh, is not, is not found in, in what the world is, you know, it's not in its material form. It's not in its physicality or, uh, the fact that it has families and states and societies and cultures. No, the, the problem is ethical entirely. And so the, the antithesis between the kingdom of God and the city of man for Kuiper and Bavink was emphatically ethical. It was because of moral choice, sin. And, and that means that God is coming to renew creation. He's going to fr- form new creation. He's going mm-hmm. to recreate creation to its original purposes. Uh, he's going to do it through Christ, but he's not coming to destroy creation not at all because the problem with creation is not creation it's mm-hmm. moral it's mm-hmm. ethical mm-hmm. and and so uh that that distinction between the kingdom of god and the kingdom of man as an ethical antithesis is at the heart of everything else um in terms of w- what it means to that faith matters for all of life um because uh, because of common grace uh and because of salvific grace special grace god has said uh, I love this world and I love uh, the spheres that I've given to it. I love the family. I love the state and all these things. And all these things are going to be subsumed and made one, made one organic whole in the second coming of Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ is the state mm-hmm. uh, and the church is the family. And uh, all these things are not to be totally annihilated. No, they're they're to be redeemed and renewed in Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God himself. And so that informed the way uh, they thought a Christian should relate to these aspects of life in the now and, and in the not yet. Hmm. Wow. That's yeah, good, Corey. That, yeah. That, that's a wonderful answer, Corey. And I think it, it's worth emphasizing that um, if the transformationalist project oftentimes go along with a kind of um, progressive advancement of the kingdom of God by way of human achievement. Yep. Yep. in a kind of post-millennial sense, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, not so with neo-Calvinism. So mm-hmm. the sort of um, organic churches, the individuals work in witnessing to the kingdom of God in their respective spheres of existence. Um, it's not something that brings about the kingdom now, but it's a witness to the kingdom later. The kingdom of God later is actually brought about by God alone in an apocalyptic mm-hmm. sense. It's single-handedly brought about by God. Um, sorry, Nick. I guess you wanted to say something. It seems like. No, no. I... Oh, okay. Never mind. Oh god, <laughs> I was it. just taking a breath. I. <laughs> he always wants to say something, but that's for yeah. He can wait. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay, yeah. So I think you know. Um, another thing we can we can say to that, therefore, is that whatever we're doing here to witness to that final kingdom now, is is never an advancing of the kingdom of God per se. So sometimes in class, I talk about it as a, tra- as a chastened transformational witness rather than <laughs> transformationalism, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. So when Christians enter into a particular sphere, it should make a difference when um, family members come to Christ, it should make a difference to the culture of the family. Right. So um, that's a very modest claim, I think, and people should be able to get on board with something like that. Hmm. Oh, that's good. Good stuff, guys. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, I my final kind of question would just be advice from you guys on a practical note. This is a very kind of academic question, and I just want to bring it back and in, in, in the Christmas theme, maybe tie a little bow on this. <laughs> Even so, though this comes out after Christmas. Oh, okay. Well, there. Oh, yeah, it does. It comes out in January, I think. Yeah. So either way, a little belated Christmas, but put a little bow on it. Something advice, practical advice for thoughtful Christians, just... <laughs> how we can apply neo-Calvinism into our Christian lives today. Like, where do we kind of, where do we go from here? Kind of question. That's a great question. Um, (laughs) So I guess um, there, there's two ways. You can kind of think of it like your 16 theses at the end of the book too, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I guess the first thing to say is to get the book and read those 16 theses and <laughs> yeah. uh, digest them yeah. properly. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. but um, I, I think one one way I, I've been thinking about this too is, is Neo-Calvinism gives you a theological framework for you not to despise where you are, if that makes sense. I, I think um, uh, Bobbing talks about 
a kind of twin pathology of world flight to world conformity, if that makes mm. sense. Mm -hmm. And it comes that that sort of the twin mentality comes from the conviction that, you know, well, if you're world flight, well, the world is a terrible, sinful place. I'm going to run away from it and I'm going to form my own little Christian enclave. Um, or, you know, this present age is really, really terrible. I really want to retrieve a golden age in the past. And I don't want to do that. Um, Bobbing says, I don't want to do that because there is no such golden age because sin has run through all of human history, especially after the fall, right? Mm -hmm. There's everything has been impacted by sin. So there is no untainted golden age to which we should return. And the world conformity is another way of saying like, okay, if the world is sinful, there's nothing we can do, nothing we can run nothing nowhere we can run run toward then i'm just going to conform myself to this modern age and, and just leave my theology behind i think neo-calvinism gives you a robust theological grounding to say i know this is a sin-drenched world and yet god is calling me to be faithful today and i'm not supposed to run away from the world because god loves the world <clears throat> and god is still sovereign today that um he is still the father of this world in this present age and no matter uh, how self-consciously the world is against God right now, um, God's common grace is still going to shine in that world. And God has called me to pronounce the good news of special grace to this world. So I think it gives you, uh, it, it, it words away those twin It gives you a third way, just like <laughs> I've, I've heard it, it you does. guys talk about uh, exactly. 20 times it before. Is, it is totally a third way, but it is, it's a third way, which is the original first way, which is, you know, we are called <laughs> yeah. to be salt and light yeah. in the world. And, you know, we are modern people. We're, we're living in the 21st century. We're recording a podcast right now using modern technology over Zoom, which is very new. We're not using Skype anymore. <laughs> and wh why, why, why can Christians keep using the new technology that is produced by sinful humanity, right? And not despise ourselves and not feel like we're just unfaithful, therefore. Yeah. And um, co-opt that, you know, so um, if you take a look at Genesis chapter four, um, the line of Cain is where we get our agriculture and music mm -hmm. and technology from. Mm -hmm. And what we see is uh, the people of God using those same things later on. And, you know, the lyre and the harp is being used by the psalmist to proclaim the worship of God. So I think in the same way, you know, we're, it gives us a really robust theological grounding, therefore, for a, a healthier conscience toward um, embracing where we are in the modern age and recognizing that we don't have to be against everything um, in the modern age for us to be faithful um, mm -hmm. because um, God loves creation and by common grace, we can take what is good and deploy it for godly means. So Corey has, has brought an insight on this that's really important from 1 Timothy 4. Mm -hmm. Everything that is received with thanksgiving is made holy, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's a very neo-Calvinistic text. And and Kuiper and Bobbing do refer to it, but maybe not enough. But I think that would be one of the most important texts, Corey. Hmm. Real quick, Greg, can we throw oh. Twitter into there too? <laughs> yeah, I, I've got a conflicting, a conflicted relationship with Twitter. I'm not I'm now on it. Yeah, um, this, this has been a long time coming for you coming on. Yeah, he's trying to redeem Twitter now. Well, I don't know if I'm very successful at it, but it's uh, I've been on it for two months now. Yeah. And uh it's a whole new world, let's just say. Christians right. can use Twitter. That's a good example. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Whether we can use it well is a different yeah. question. Right. Yeah. No, that's a great answer, Gray. I mean, First Timothy four, Paul was the first Neo Calvinist. So read read more Paul is a good answer. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I'll say, I mean, I really can just add add to that and repeat. Um in some ways the answer is carry on the normal work of the church at, at all times and then to the Tower of Tower of Babel situation where it feels a lot more like the New Jerusalem outside the door. You, you carry on the normal work of the church, institute an organism doing what it's called to do. Um, and I think that's what Gray was largely saying there. I mean, engage. I think every Christian's called to engage critically in every arena of life and ask how does, does Christ matter for what I'm doing in this particular sphere of existence, whether that's what how you do breakfast time, uh, in the morning with your family or mm -hmm. um, what Netflix, what your relationship to Netflix looks like. Um, I mean, talk about, uh, I think if, if Bob and Ken Kuiper were alive today, um, they would be writing about TV streaming, you know, mm -hmm. TV shows all the time. And, and um, how do you appropriate, learn from critique uh, the shows that you love to watch as a Christian? I mean, this is, this is exactly uh, what we're talking about. 
they were doing it with the, the heights of the sciences and, and the best of the psychological texts that were being published. But, but yeah. all of us have got to do it with, uh, Amazon prime, you know, and, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe, maybe the last thing I'll say is never, never, we're, I think they help us to see that we should never stop growing into what it means to be biblical. Um, so at the heart of all of this is the Bible and, uh, they, they were students of the Bible and, um, the biblical, there's a re I mean, the biblical theology movement that we're experiencing right now, mm -hmm. uh, which is flourishing and wonderful and, and helping us to read the Bible, uh, better than, than ever perhaps, um, is, is a product of the neo-Calvinist movement and, um, and Gerhard is and, and others oh, yeah. that have, oh, yeah. have gotten that kicked off. And, uh, I think at the end of the day, we're just trying to be biblical and and realized um, the, the centrality of Christ in all things begins with the centrality of Christ in the Old and New Testaments, and uh, and uh, so so there there's that, and um, that's that's an important one. Hmm. Yeah, Maybe one more thing to add to Go that, for especially coming now as an as an back as an immigrant worker in America <laughs> and, yeah. and coming to the polarized situation, especially yeah. as we're seeing around us today. I think one thing we can say as well is I think with, with Bobby and Kuiper, because of their robust theology, um, there is a note of, of um, hopefulness, let's say optimistic mm -hmm. hopefulness in the sovereignty of God over all things, which leads them toward not a entire suspicion of the culture around them, especially in institutions around them, and especially in um, democracy, I would say, mm -hmm. with them as well. Um, one of their main central messages is that, uh, if we've repeated this in, in many other conversations before, but if, if Christ is Lord, then Christians are not, mm -hmm. um, which means that we, sh we shouldn't look for some kind of overreach on our part to become the culture winners, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. But we should expect to live with unbelief all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, we might be persecuted, um, but because of God's sovereignty and common grace, we should develop a disposition toward the other that seeks some kind of relative peace, harmony, and common ground for today, if that makes sense. And so um, instead of the polarization that, that, that we see here today, we shouldn't nourish that sort of polarization. We should develop a healthy, I think, trust towards God that we can develop peacefulness in the midst of deep difference, which means hopefully a renewed disposition of trust toward things like democracy, um, which Kuiper and Bobbing would have been uh, more toward rather than a monarchical sort of situation, mm. I would argue. So um, that's perhaps a, a, a note that we should sound off as well today. That's really Very helpful. Good. Yeah, so to to cap off this uh, this conversation, which I hope is really helpful for people mm -hmm. and what's their appetite for the book and gives them a better understanding of neo-Calvinism, kind of its foundations and, and doctrines and how it looks at the world. Uh, and people are wondering, well, I want, I want more Corey and Gray in my life. Where can I, where can I find them? Where can I find their work? And then I know you guys have more stuff coming up. So maybe if you want to plug some of the stuff that you guys have uh, coming up. Yeah, sure. Thanks for that. Um, I don't know if anybody needs more of us in their lives. <laughs> I don't think that's true. <laughs> You'd be all. surprised. Yeah. You never uh, know. But yeah, I mean, we, so we have a podcast as well. And uh, that's right. So, so we talk about a lot of this quite often on, on Grace and Common podcast um, with James Eglinton and yep. Monterinus de Young from Amsterdam. Um, and then we, yeah, we've got a number of projects um, always. It's hard to remember sometimes what they are. Um, let's say Gray and I are, are finishing up edits for the TNT Clark handbook on Neo Calvinism. Mm -hmm. That's a 40, 40 author um, work uh, that's got um, some great essays in it. Tim Keller, yep. uh, Neo Calvinism and Pastoral Ministry. I saw that. Yep. Uh, guys like Walter Storff and um, uh, all sorts, a couple from us and, and many others um, on different arenas and how the, the different. I, I talked at the beginning about the, the river and the tributaries and stuff. And then that's really what that book is trying to hmm. do is, is kind of take a big ma massive tome assessment of all of it and, and, and figure out where, where it's gone and where it's been and, and what matters. Um, we've just finished uh, Christianity and science. As I saw that with Crossway, that'll be yeah. out with Crossway in August. 
yep. of 23. Uh, that is a follow up to Christian Worldview, a book that yep. he wrote in the same year as Christian Worldview, Bobby did. So it looks like Christian called... Worldview, but it's a different color. Yeah, yeah, they're hmm. they're doing them kind of together, so that'll yeah. be a, a a bit of a, a package deal, I think, in the future. Um, yeah. What else, Gray? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> There's a lot. Um, some some are still not um official yet, but we're yeah. working yeah. on um uh that we can't say yet. Uh, but it's very exciting. There's lots of things that's coming out in the New Calvinist Extreme. I just finished um a draft, a first draft of a book on Bobbing and theological anthropology, mm-hmm. and that's contracted with TNT Clark again as a kind of sequel to God and Knowledge. Um, so look out for that and um, another book um, this time with Lexham Press introducing reform theological anthropology hmm. so um, that's that's coming out on my end but I and Corey we can't wait to announce projects that are on the <laughs> way but not yet official mm. but come 2023 Lord willing or maybe even all the way toward early 2024 more of those announcements are coming so mm. Maybe after, offline, we can talk about that. <laughs> Sounds <afterwards>. good. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, well, thank you guys for your work. Thanks for uh, cobbling these things together for for those of us who don't know much or those who wanted to learn much. Or <clears throat> I think for the most part, at least those who are listening to this probably may have heard about neo-Calvinism, but may have some either quibbles about or unsure uncertainties or maybe even um, a wrong representation of it. Uh, and to to get this out there and have a right representation of it, the right sources, the right forebearers, the forefathers, and to ground it, <clears throat> I think, in a, in a good and helpful and fruitful conversation to to keep going. So thanks for writing this and thanks for coming on our show. Thanks to both of you. Really great. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks, Absolutely. Yeah.